This is The Meaningful Way. I'm your host, Luke Iorio. Today, you're in for a real treat in this episode for a number of reasons. First is that we get to dive in on a topic that everybody wants, and that's happiness. How is it that we see it manifesting in our lives, and where is it that we can develop more of it so we experience more and more happiness throughout all that we do? But this is also tied to a much bigger movement, a a change, an evolution that's going on out there. And you're going to hear about one of the pioneers in this movement, and you're going to hear about a groundbreaking event taking place in the middle of March, which you're also going to be invited to. And so today, I want you to sit back, enjoy this conversation of a journey of this pioneer, what he is up to in today's world and how he is bringing this to fruition, and to learn more about how we're going to go through this transformation of a framework that he describes, of leaving this old framework that leads us into a trap of wanting more and instead gets us to evolve into a place that we can thrive and we can flourish and we can experience this authentic happiness that would just bring a smile from ear to ear for so much of us. Today, I have the good fortune of introducing you to Luis Gallardo, who's the founder of the World Happiness Summit. He's a social innovator and entrepreneur with the higher purpose of elevating the vibration of the planet by developing ideas, connecting thought leaders, activists, and communities, and increasing awareness on the science of happiness, holistic education, and smart innovation. Luis has been an advisor to CEOs, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, Nobel laureates, political and institutional game changers on strategic personal positioning and brand building. And that access to the brightest and most conscious individuals has inspired him to understand that the world needs new lenses to understand growth and how humans and societies can thrive. He's worked throughout the corporate world as a global executive, and he's also been a protagonist of transformation of industries such as professional services as well as the internet. He's been an international observer with the UN and OSCE in post-armed conflicts establishing democracy and the right to vote. For Luis, happiness is a human right and a life choice, an enabler of human development and social innovation. That's why he is committed to creating with the World Happiness Summit. Luis has also been recently appointed by the UN's International Day of Happiness, which is on March 20th, to serve on the executive team and to create the global strategy for the day. And so with that, Luis, I am so glad to welcome you to The Meaningful Way. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Luke, to be here. Thanks, Louise. And, you know, I've, I've got to ask, before we roll in, because I want to hear about the event, we want to talk a bit about the, the world happiness movement, even beyond the summit uh, that's going on. But before we get to that, I've got to ask you that as an advisor to all of these amazing people and being in the fortunate positions that you've been in to see some of the things that, that you've seen, I'm curious a bit about who were you? Meaning earlier in your life, tell us a little bit about where that journey began that ultimately led you to some of these amazing places and connections. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question. I think that if we answer in a Buddhist way, basically I would say <laughs> I, I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that basically I am, and, and I would say that I'm, I'm curious, and that's that's probably one of my key drivers in life. Mm-hmm. I I really love to explore, and I think from the, I mean from from very very early age, I've been I mean studying politics and political science, sociology, international uh, relations, uh, uh, peace studies, and conflict mm-hmm. resolution. But then I move into marketing communications. And, but actually, my major was biology and physics. So it's like uh, when, when, when I think about what brought me to, I, to where I am today, mm-hmm. probably I think curiosity is the, is the key driver. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, a discovery that is becoming as well connect, a connection and meaningful, and making meaningful connections in the world. Mm-hmm. So I would say that. Um, Probably I read a lot and I met so many amazing people mm-hmm. that uh, that brought me a kind of uh, a really interesting perspective about 
why things happen. So I'm, I always, I'm always curious about the why of things. Mm -hmm. Probably that curiosity is what brought me to where I am now. But basically, my 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 past is very similar to what I'm doing now. It's really connecting and discovering every day. Mm. You know, that's interesting because that, that is an, <laughs> an incredible range of, of things to have been studied and interested in then, and then worked on from uh, majoring in biology to then uh, international policy and, and uh, international business and then going into marketing. Uh, but I, I guess one of the things that comes up there when you talk about curiosity being part of what guided you through these different avenues and the, the connections that have been opened up for you, talk a little bit about what does it take to follow your curiosity? Because I think there's a lot of people that they'll have these things that are really intriguing and interesting to them, and yet they'll just kind of leave them off to the side as if it's, well, I need time for that one day, or it's a, an interest, a hobby, but they don't follow on it. What was it that enabled you to follow that curiosity? Yeah, it's, um, it's, for me, I think it's been easy because that was my priority. I always felt like, well, if, if I want to know more, if I want to see more, I have to do it. I cannot, mm -hmm. I cannot be stopped. So I was born in, in Spain, but, um, but very quickly, I, I, uh, as a kid, I travel, I, I travel a lot with my family and, and then, uh, as part of my, my, my education, I went to the United Kingdom and, and, and that was when I was 20 and I, I studied part of my, my college degree um, in the United Kingdom, actually in Europe, there is still a program called Erasmus where they give you the chance to actually do a part of your college degree in, in another country. Mm -hmm. So from that moment, I, I found that I really want to interact uh, with different people around the world. I love diversity. And I made that my priority. That's probably why I've been, I've been doing as much traveling as I've been doing and as much learning because that's been my priority all the time. So basically when you, mm -hmm. when I think that, that you focus on one priority, everything's, everything kinds of organized around that. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I've been fortunate to make my priority something that fulfills me a lot. Uh, that's probably why probably I was able to do that. Um, that would be the answer, I think. And that's interesting because I think when bringing up that, that, that word priority, because I think I, I recently heard this of, you know, when you go to the root of where does priority come from, it literally means the next thing or the first thing. And nowadays, people are always talking about all of their priorities. And of course, if we have all of these priorities, which is the one that's the real priority? And I think you're, you're making it clear that you knew what was kind of central to, you know, who you were and the way you were growing. Uh, and you knew what that first thing was. And it makes it easier to pursue it if you're really, really clear on that. And so I guess, you know, as, as you then expand into, because, I mean, you've, you've achieved such great success uh, in what we traditionally, you know, refer to success in terms of climbing the corporate ladder and having those types of achievements and everything else. And I'm curious that as your curiosity allowed you to move in this direction, uh, working for some of the big ad agencies, working for one of the most well-respected consulting firms in the world, what do you believe, in addition to your curiosity, that allowed you to fuel those, those achievements and allowed you to achieve some of the things that you did uh, at a relatively young age within that environment? Yeah, I, um, I feel like definitely I'm so lucky that I found that curiosity and discovery were my priorities. And then, uh, and now that, that, I, that I know a bit more on the science of happiness, I feel like mm -hmm. from a genetic point of view, I am 50% positive. Mm -hmm. So, so that that's that's an advantage at some point, because um, I think that my attitude has been always around bringing as much passion and enthusiasm uh, to to whatever I do. Mm -hmm. So, basically, my first job uh, and my second job and my third job were, have been always bringing a lot of passion into it and a lot of enthusiasm and actually bringing people together. At some point, I think that uh, very early, I was a coach, handball, you know, European mm -hmm. handball coach uh, in sports and, and my job, I, mean, I was playing, but at the same time, I was, I, I became a coach when I was 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, I was playing. So that means that when I was 12, I was teaching kids who were eight. <laughs> uh, and I kept 
with that role for for many years, probably more than 15 years. Yeah. And I feel like the combination of knowing what it takes to to do things, and but actually bringing the best out of people from an early age, because when you have a team, basically, mm-hmm. and you're the coach, you feel the difference between being the player and being the coach. Mm-hmm. So when you are the coach, it's not about you actually scoring, it's actually somebody scoring. And when you help somebody score, then you realize how the important how the importance of the team is and mm-hmm. and when you move that into the corporate environment you realize that pre- basically if you want to succeed you have to help all the succeed so basically I, i've been playing all my career the role of coach mm-hmm. coach in from a sports point of view mm-hmm. so i was always trying to find the best players i was always to to set individual goals and collective goals. And when you once you set individual goals and collective goals, then you help everybody to maximize the impact. And when you do that, actually you you become a, a important for 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 everybody, but because you are helping them to 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 maximize their potential. And and when that's the case, actually everybody becomes better. And if everybody becomes better, you actually can uh, relax a bit <laughs> and actually spend more time uh, exploring and discovering. Mm. So, so in the end, I didn't do this because I wanted to show everybody that I was uh, that I knew a lot. It was the opposite. I was really pushing everybody because I wanted to have time to discover mm. Mm. and to do something. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. so it's a lot, it sounds a bit selfish, but I think the combination of discovery and curiosity with uh, uh, applying coaching, sports mm-hmm. coaching strategies uh, uh, in, in the corporate world, mm-hmm. it was very, 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 very good for me because uh, in the end I was achieving a lot of results in a short term be- because I got the best people uh, working with me as well. Well, and I think, you know, and something you're highlighting there, and it's, it's things that exactly, as you said, with the science of happiness among some of the other studies of, of, you know, psychology of success and things like that that have been done now that you're highlighting is because of that curiosity and that discovery and the passion that went into it, you were very flexible and adaptable and it was much more about what you could discover and learn from others as opposed to, as you said, having the answer and kind of directing all the work. So it, it's that perspective of being able to help others succeed and at the same time recognizing there's individual as well as collective goals and how to create alignment between them. And the more that we're able to do that and kind of be curious and discover how it is we're going to create that alignment, uh, the more that it's the the rising tide that, that raises all boats. Uh, and that sounds like very much what's been central to a lot of your success. And nowadays we read a lot more saying that that's very much central to a lot of people who, who have found the types of uh, career professional success uh, that you have, but also even success in our own personal lives and family lives. Um, one of the things I know you, you, you talk a lot about uh, is this idea of thinking holistically but acting personally. And I was wondering if you could share first, before we go exactly into what that means, where does that come from? Because to think holistically, act personally, sounds like there's probably a few lessons that were learned along the way, some tough spots, some challenges that you may have faced that helped you come to this understanding that could then be shared with others. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit of that journey uh, and then lead into what, what that led to with this idea of think holistic and act personal. Well, I appreciate this this question because that goes actually to the core of one of my uh, discoveries in mm-hmm. um, in and actually uh, taking in, into account different environments. Mm-hmm. One of them is is post arm conflicts, and the other the other one is is working at the corporate level. So when I um, I, I happen to to be an international observer. Uh, for example, in in Bosnia post conflict, mm. and when you get to Shepska Republic, and your job is basically going from town hall to town hall, uh, coaching mayors, and and basically the civil society to cast votes, actually, uh, and actually to make a fair democratic elections, you realize that when you are there, uh, people are so into what they do. Mm-hmm. That if somebody would say you have to think global and act local, they would say what? Mm-hmm. What, what is global and what is local right now? Because mm-hmm. actually we are 
we are trying to survive here. We are trying. We are so passionate now because we have democracy, because the war is over. Now what we need is to really make a difference, mm. uh, and we are already local, uh, and we are already active locals. And when you tell me global, what, what does it mean? Is that is that Bosnia again? Is that uh, Srpska Republic? Mm. Is that uh, is that Europe? Is that the world? So they, they at the local level, uh, acting local doesn't work. Right. Um, because you're already acting local. And then the second part for me was the globalization. And it's, uh, so I was the chief marketing officer of, of Deloitte in Spain. Mm-hmm. And at some point I was offered the job of leading a global brand marketing and communications uh, in New York. And I, when I, I, took the, I took the job and when I, when I got to New York, um, my office was basically a head in Broadway. And actually, the CEO was asking me to develop the overall brand and marketing strategy for the company mm. worldwide. And, and I said, well, I have to think global. <laughs> and, <laughs> and suddenly there I was completely lost. It's like global in New York, <laughs> coming from Spain. Uh, what is global? I, global means the, I mean the United States and the United Kingdom, the Anglo-Saxon world uh, is this a, a combination of, of the top countries. So it didn't work. So with those, with those two combinations of local and global not, not working, I say, okay, how, how, am, how am I going to develop a strategy that actually works? And, and I got into a system dynamics, which is one mm-hmm. of the uh, amazing disciplines coming from, from, from Albany and MIT and, and actually uh, it was uh, uh, David Siegel who actually uh, brought it in many ways uh, mm. into the corporate language um, and, and Jay Foster who was the, the, the professor who actually developed the whole, the whole theory from an engineer point of view I looked into it and I really liked the way things are interconnected and they are dependent mm. of many other variables which is actually now what you discover from Buddhism and many other religions in, in, in the world mm-hmm. so I took, I took that basically a connectivity and an interdependency of variables. And I realized that actually in order to succeed from a marketing point of view, I had to look at the whole and in and understanding the interconnections. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's when I changed global by holistic. And then uh, basically I, I was working in a professional services organization in a B2B, but B2B that doesn't really work because it's not business talking to business. It's actually people talking to people mm-hmm. and people trust people. Even though you have a big brand, uh, in the end, somebody's going to buy from you because they trust you. Mm-hmm. So that, I, that became part of my uh, philosophy as well. How can I impact as many people as possible from a people perspective? perspective? And that's when... What, that's why I changed local to personal. So basically, holistic and personal means that you think of the whole and the interaction of different parts, and then you act at the human level, and you understand how, why humans make the decisions, and then you uh, try to help them do do that even better. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of my, my key learnings on how think holistically uh, and acting personally comes, comes from. I think it's it's a, a wonderful way of truly expressing what the the original Think Global Act Local was really trying to accomplish, uh, and being able to recognize that when we think holistic, it is that interconnectedness and interdependence that we need to be more aware of than ever before, because we are a more interconnected and interdependent uh, world, uh, more so than ever before. And then to be able to act personal, and I love the way that you frame it in terms of acting at that human level. Uh, and really bringing in that type of component. So we, we are understanding each other and acting from a place of understanding in a very, very different manner. So now let's, if we were to pivot a bit, because I can see where this is going, and I'm, I'm very, very curious to see how you now uh, tie this together, take us to the happiness movement. Because what you're doing, and I can see the seeds of, of Think Holistic, Act Personal, uh, what that was planting in terms of what you then wanted to accomplish with the World Happiness Summit as the event itself, but then the World Happiness Movement that it is really beginning to spearhead. And so maybe take us through a little bit of of where that positive psychology and the direction of happiness came in here for your journey 
And then how does the the seeds of Think Holistic and Act Personal uh, really kind of blossom into into what this is now becoming? Yeah, because because as as you are describing, every everything comes when it has to come. Basically, mm-hmm. arrives at the moment it has to. And I think that it, now, when I think about the happiness movement and and how is that's that's a, becoming a reality, not just because I'm. I'm behind, uh, I'm, I'm just one of one part of the whole. But I feel like uh, at some point, uh, when you think about the whole and you understand the human beings, what you really sense today in the world is that we are not paying enough attention to something people really want mm-hmm. and things that people really, and things that, I mean, sorry, uh, and things that really matter to people. And and this is being, basically is about the being, more than the doing. It's, it's about who I am, what is my role, what do, what do I do, why do I have to do things in the world? And you realize that uh, today in corporate, I mean in the U.S., 10,000 or 10 billion, sorry, 10 billion U.S. dollars are spent on self uh, motivational books, but at the same time, 10 billions are spent on antidepressive mm. medication. Uh, and you realize that no more than 30% of the workforce is happy at work. And you realize that um, uh, more and more, not just w- we as individuals, but actually societies and governments are paying a bit more of attention to well being and happiness, but is it still? Is is still not the priority for most people. I think that we we've been framed in so many ways uh, from the from the economy mm-hmm. and to be uh, and to do more and to grow more and to be bigger and that at some point uh, we've been in we are in the, in the trap of a continuous growth, which is part of uh, what is forcing us to not pay enough attention to who we are instead of what we have mm-hmm. or what we do. So I feel like mm-hmm. uh, for I was very fortunate to, to work with the World Economic Forum for many years and realize that uh, when leaders get together and they have a framework, they really are creative in the framework. And it's, it's, it's interesting because we, when, you, when you talk to artists, uh, it looks like... Th- why canvas is the best thing to start with. And actually, they tell you that that's the most difficult thing to start with. So they, they rather have a framework because that way you can really be creative within the framework. Mm-hmm. The, wor- the world we have today is being built within the framework of economy. Mm-hmm. And because the framework is economy, we are very creative in how we actually get richer and how we actually make better trade. Uh, but that's something that is, from my point of view, is not helping human beings to achieve the whole potentials. And that's how I found that actually in 2012, the United Nations uh, basically had a high-level meeting and inspired by Bhutan and mm-hmm. the gross national happiness that actually the king of Bhutan brought uh, to the country 45 years ago in 1971, they acknowledged that actually there might be other ways to frame how we humans develop. And, and that framework uh, could be a new economic paradigm. So I, I linked uh, with uh, most of the players of that high-level meeting, and for some reason they never got together in a strategic way after that. And, 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 but I was asking, why, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to do that before? And everybody said, absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. But we need, we need somebody to, to uh, who actually can lead this. So actually, uh, because of what I saw at the World Economic Forum, so powerful, and they've been around for 45, 40, 45 years with the framework of, of economy, I thought, okay, what about if we use the framework of happiness and well-being instead of the economy? What, what, what could happen? So because the, that framework is different and that framework is based on human needs mm-hmm. and that actually framework is based on what people really want because ultimately people want to be happy. So that's that's how the happiness movement now 
uh, is basically moving to Miami in March mm -hmm. uh, because I think that we are creating a an ecosystem with academics, with governments, with uh, the civil society, with uh, with corporations that actually want to see evolution of human being development from 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 another framework. So that's that's how the happiness movement is is coming together. And I'm I'm basically a one part of that of, of the whole system. Well, I think I mean it's a it's a very very profound uh, paradigm shift that is now coming about. And as you said, I mean you you gave some of the unbelievably alarming stats in terms of uh, not just the amount that we we spend in terms of general personal improvement and everything else, but the corollary of unfortunately what's being spent on antidepressants and and you know the all the disease that's connected to stress levels and, and heart disease and things like that, uh, and framing things that when we are within a framework we can be very creative within that framework, but it's still going to produce whatever. Uh, the confines of that that frame happen to be, and I think there's a key phrase in there that you you sort of uh, brought out that I want everybody to be aware of is be aware of that trap of more, the trap of more. So that constant idea of we need more of this, we need to grow into this, uh, it comes unfortunately out of a place of lack. And if I'm hearing you correct, and I'd love to to make sure I'm on track here, and, and then have you expand on it, where the framework for happiness is beginning to pivot as opposed to this framework of, of lack and how it is that we need more, it's really how is it that we fill people up right from day one in their development and their evolution. And it sounds like as part of that, while happiness is the moniker, what's really behind it is that this is a, a more complete framework for well-being and a way of developing and evolving so that happiness becomes more of our natural state. Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's amazing what happens, and I uh, and, and and it's interesting because I use frameworks in different environments. Mm -hmm. So even even building brands, because one of my uh, something I've done for for many year, for many years is helping uh, corporations, products, and people to build their personal brand, and it's amazing how even color. When you choose colors mm. for your brand and you say, well, I'm going to stick to green, blue, and white. Mm -hmm. How combining those helps you express who you are in a so meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Act, but actually, when you have all colors, uh, you actually struggle. And at some point, you, mm -hmm. you, 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 don't, you are not authentic in many ways because you are, you are using things that actually don't work. Because, but because you have them, at some point, you use them. So I feel like having this framework of happiness and say, okay, we as human beings ultimately want to be happy or at least be happier, 1% happier. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? And you realize, and now that I've been so fortunate over the last couple of years to talk to the thought leaders in, 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 in the economy, in, in positive psychology, in uh, sociology, philosophy, you realize that basically what, what they say is, oh, yes, I mean, research shows that actually once you crave or you understand uh, your purpose, uh, then when you keep moving on it, there is a moment where it doesn't matter how much you earn, mm -hmm. you stop being happier mm -hmm. because you need something else. You need friends. You need relationships. You need to actually be helpful. You have to uh, be as kind as you can. There are so many elements that actually can improve 1% happiness and it's not money and it's not having more at all. However, because we keep using the framework of economy and most of us have to wake up in the morning in order to make up payroll in order to mm -hmm. pay for what we need, actually we forget that we, we are not here in this world in order to wake up every morning and every mm -hmm. morning and make a payroll because that's part of the way we, we've decided to structure our lives mm -hmm. in the societies where we want to have more. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, 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 it's a combination of a philosophical mm -hmm. and practical mm -hmm. way of looking at life but uh, what you really discover very soon when people start understanding who they want to be at some point and, and, and how, to, how to get there is that 
90% of what we have to do is really not linked to the economy at all. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's very important. So that that I think that's that's why the debate the debate today mm-hmm. in the world has to be as important on happiness and well being as as it is today on economy. If you could just even elaborate just a little bit further on what might be one or two starting points. So for the for the individuals that are out there listening to us and listening to this direction, this movement, what might be might what might be one or two of those starting points for bringing a little more happiness into their kind of everyday life and work, uh, because I think one of the other things that, that you've even exhibited and illustrated through your own journey is that if we begin to bring some of this happiness into our lives, into our work, even while we're still figuring out how we're going to pay the mortgage and pay the bills and those types of things, that that little extra happiness actually is part of the fuel that leads to some of the other other material successes that we're also after to fulfill our needs. So what, what are just maybe one or two practices or tips or behaviors that maybe even you've applied personally that have led you to that one or even a couple more percent of happiness each day? Yeah, this is a great question. And this is, this is really a part of the research that mm-hmm. comes from, uh, from people like Sonia Lubomirsky or Sean Eichor, that basically what, what they say is that happiness is not the end, it's actually the beginning. Happier people achieve more. Yeah. So that means that if you can focus on building a bit 1% more of happiness in your life, you realize that you are going to do more and you are, you are going to be more successful in many, many ways. So I think that, at least for me, probably would say that uh, uh, there are four key elements in mm-hmm. order to, uh, to achieve more happiness. One is celebration. Mm. And it sounds like, oh, party. Well, <laughs> it's celebration. It's actually celebrate as much as possible with yourself, with your team, with your people, good things in life. And celebration means saying, saying thank you. And celebration means uh, being um, uh, using the value of gratitude as much as you can. Yeah. So celebrate and say thank you as often as you can and is important interesting because there is so many experiments that actually showcase that when you do this for a number of days and and, and, and that's between 21 40 days or 90 days you actually your brain starts rewiring in a way that actually helps you be one percent or two percent or three percent happier so i think the celebration is is a key one this the second element for me critical is service mm. so we shouldn't forget that we are dependent of everybody. I mean, it's like the Dalai the Lama, the Lama, the Lama talks about dependent and independent variables. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's not dependent, is if sorry, if it's not independent, is dependent. So that means that it's very difficult to to find really independent things in the world. Very very little things. We all depend on something. When we wake up in the morning and we watch TV, negative news are going to have an impact on us and we are going to depend on the negativity. And there is some research by uh, 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 Michelle Gillen and Mm -hmm. Ariana Huffington that says that just 10 minutes in the morning of negative news are going to push you into a negative mood through the day, Mm -hmm. at least for for, for for the first three, four hours of the day. So imagine just a minute. Uh, so I think that service is very important because when you realize that we are dependent of each other, is for our own good that we should be serving others. So I feel like uh, that service is absolutely important. And then the third one is I think is commitment, because when you are committed, you really get the best out of you and out of others. You cannot be saying, yes, I'm going to do this, and then you don't do it, and, and say, well, nothing happens. No, actually, commitment is is very, very important. And then the fourth one for me is is knowledge and wisdom. Mm. So the the wiser you are, the more consciousness you, you have. And the more consciousness you have, the more vibration you can elevate in the planet. So that means that uh, when you are wiser, you can you can do you can do much more and help many other people to achieve their their goals. So I think that mm-hmm. learning con- constant learning and, and being very focused that's gonna give you a lot of energy in order to 
celebrate, in order to service, and in order to be committed. So I will focus on those four. Excellent. And so if we bring this now with, with this, this big movement and framework, we bring these four elements and we bring it into what is occurring in March at the, the first of the World Happiness Summits, what is the aim of the event that is being held March 17th to 19th? I think that we are, the, the way are, we are uh, focusing this first uh, gathering of what we call uh, global leaders on happiness and well-being is really creating the crossroads mm -hmm. for the years to come. So we don't see this as an event mm -hmm. that is going to end in March uh, after three days of, um, of an amazing experience. Uh, we feel that this is really the, the common on party, is, is, is to showcase, is to bring together as many people who have a similar purpose in life and who people who actually are intrigued about how to be happier in the world. So I think that we are we are really creating and we are really focusing on having an, an experience that uh, helps people to understand techniques. Mm -hmm. So we are bringing really practical techniques for, pe for people to, to use. But at the same time, we want people to come together and understanding that working together over the next years is going to be very important for, for all of us in order to benefit from each other uh, and, and, and be wiser and, and, and have a major impact in the world. So I would say it's a combination of grassroots building and mm -hmm. actually getting real value with real techniques that actually work for many people in many, in many spaces of knowledge. So if we bring this kind of fully around, the name of this podcast is The Meaningful Way. And as we've kind of danced around a bit, that meaning is one of those also, those elements uh, that is very important in, in the way that we find it and connect to it, at times even create it. It's one of those elements that is linked to our long-term happiness and well-being. And so if I were to ask you, what have you found to be your meaningful way? What comes to mind? Yeah, I think right now I'm in my meaningful way. I feel like <laughs> I'm li I'm in the flow. I'm, I I I think this concept of flow is is really important for happiness and joy, because um, when you feel like every day you meet somebody, you talk to somebody else, you are making connections, you get. Um, People, for example, just now I, I've been invited uh, to one of these meetings that the OECD uh, has in Paris in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. focus on measuring business impact on people's well-being. So I've been invited, but if I've been invited to this, it's because they know that I'm interested on the topic and because they know that uh, we we can work together in the future as well. So suddenly, once you are in this flow, you realize that. All most most doors is, is start opening for you, mm -hmm. and 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 this is amazing. I mean, the feeling is so amazing mm -hmm. that you feel like what's really going on here because I want to do this and I get it, um, and I feel that this is what uh, many scientists call the flow, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that this is what many people. It say and, and think is the meaningful way in many ways. Mm -hmm. So right now I feel like I'm in a really important meaningful way because the higher purpose that we have behind the World Happiness Summit is really elevating consciousness. And we believe that elevating consciousness brings more success and a happier world. So I feel like right now I bring in a lot of my skills into something that my work uh, in a meaningful way but this is honestly right now is going to depend on on many other people because mm -hmm. here uh, everybody has to has to do something and everybody uh, will be doing something so i feel like we are we are creating the space we are holding that secure base that is going to bring a lot of amazing people together but then it's going to be up to these people to really go farther so um, my meaningful way right now is, is probably where I'm living uh, in this moment. I'm living right now in the moment. 
you know, it's amazing to, to, to see some of the kind of the breadcrumbs of, of the trail that's been leading you to this because it's, it's as if you've been preparing uh, in many ways and probably experiences flow in many ways throughout your life, but preparing for where you are right now, bringing together just some of the incredible knowledge and wisdom and people and connections that, that you've uh, that you have found and, and uh, discovered uh, throughout the course of your life. And it's that flow, which I, you know, I love the connection to that because it is a, a rhythm to, to life that just seems to take over. And it's the way in which we prepare for it, the way in which we align our values, the way we align our purpose and our wisdom, our the talents and, and gifts that we have, that all of a sudden those things come together uh, in just this beautiful flow state, this beautiful rhythm of life. And it seems like that's very much where, where Louise, where you have found yourself. And so uh, just before I wrap up, I do want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing the journey that's led uh, not only you, but the kind of this movement of happiness to the event, the summit, and the tribe of, of movement that is going to move forward from it. So thank you so much for coming on The Meaningful Way. Well, I, I really thank you, Luke, because um, probably the, the, the main reason why we are having this uh, podcast and this conversation is because we share values, yeah. and what you do and what you are doing uh, at IPEC is is very, very meaningful for so many people. So um, I really want to say thank you because uh, you are one of those players today in the world who is who is who is really making a happy world. So thank you. Luis, thank you for that. Uh, for everybody listening, I'm going to give you a few things because first and foremost, I want to give you the website to check out the summit, which is happinesssummit.world. That's happinesssummit.world. This is truly going to be an extraordinary kickoff event, uh, kind of galvanizing type of event for this movement. You've got an unbelievable lineup of speakers, some of the most amazing individuals and thought leaders and experts, uh, as well as academics, all the way to government uh, officials that are coming together to have this conversation. So if you want to see this intersection, if you want to learn more about this framework uh, that is going to guide development and, and kind of uh, the direction in which we evolve, this is the place to be. And in addition to that, you're going to walk away with some really, really practical tools and tips and tactics and everything else because there's a lot of tangible stuff that is going to go with this so that we can all uh, kind of catapult our way down this uh, 1% to 10% to hopefully uh, even more than that percent happier throughout the course of our lives and careers. And so uh, I am very honored to be to be working with Luis as part of this event and, and be involved within the event itself. But it is truly a one-of-a-kind one of a kind thing. I hope to see you there in Miami from March 17th to 19th. And again, you can check out, even if you just Google Happiness Summit, you're going to find it, but it's happinesssummit.world. And I strongly encourage you to check it out. And so just to wrap up today's conversation, I think maybe one of the best places to uh, leave it is that as you follow your curiosity, you're going to find that there's four elements that are going to help you to bring out your happiness even more every day. Number one is to celebrate, to focus in on that thanking uh, life and situations for offering you some of the wins and rewards that you've got, to be gracious of and to acknowledge what those wins are, to be of service, to recognize the way in which we are interdependent and interconnected to one another and the way in which we can serve each other so we know that it's more than just ourselves. The more that we can make commitments to ourselves, that commitment to being our best, that resolve that it brings out and we show up in a whole new way when we do. And then finally, to be able to continue to expand your knowledge and your wisdom. The difference being is that when we have wisdom, wisdom is the application of that which we have come to know. And the more that we're able to expand that, the more we're able to celebrate, the more we're able to give, and the bigger commitments that we're able to make. And so with that, as always, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. And as always, continue to enjoy the journey. Thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Our guest is actually a speaker at the upcoming World Happiness Summit on March 17th to 19th, happening in Miami, Florida. This is going to be truly an unbelievable event that has brought together a host of thought leaders and experts from around the world on the topic of happiness, well-being, and how it is that we're going to flourish in our lives, in our world, and in our organizations. You're also going to walk away with many practical tools, exercises, and practices to help you expand happiness within your life, as well as start to get connected to a larger tribe and a bigger movement that is making happiness a reality and even a human right around the world. If you want to learn more, head over to happinesssummit.world. 
That's happinesssummit.world to learn about the World Happiness Summit happening March 17th to 19th in Miami, Florida. I hope to see you there.